think I can get started and, and welcome everybody as well. Um, for those who have uh, already joined our session today. Um, uh, my name is George Kebala Bauer and I'm a senior insights and advocacy manager uh, for the GSMA Digital Utilities Program on, and on behalf of the GSMA Mobile for Development Program and the Toilet, Port, Gro, Toilet Board Coalition, I welcome everyone to our session uh, using data to build resilient urban sanitation and waste management. I'm really excited uh, for our panel and, and presenters today. Um, they have amazing experiences to share. And um, given, uh, given how important the challenges of urban sanitation and urban waste management are in the context of rapid population growth and climate change in low and middle income countries, um, I'm really excited uh, for us to have this session today. Um, uh, just uh, in terms of um, the agenda for, for today's uh, session, we'll first uh, present uh, a bit of information about the GSMA Digital Utilities Program and the Toilet Board Coalition and, their, and, and our joint work in this, in this space of, of uh, sanitation. Um, and then um, uh, we'll, we'll, see a, we'll hear a presentation from both Athena in, in, Infonomics and the Lusaka Water Supply and Sanitation Company on strengthening uh, public data systems to improve uh, citywide inclusive sanitation. And then we'll um, hear uh, from a panel moderated uh, by Alex um, from the Toilet Board Coalition, uh, which will feature uh, different innovators working on um, uh, applying data-driven solutions to the, um, to the challenges of urban sanitation and waste management. Um, and we're really excited for that. So um, since we only have 60 minutes and we really want to hear from our uh, panelists and presenters, um, I suggest we get started um, with, the, uh, with, our, with the program overview of, of the GSMA. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have a few poll questions as well on the, um, on the interface. So uh, please um, um, be sure to answer uh, those questions. Um, and as we, as we hope um, that we'll kind of get some interaction going and, um, and we're also curious to, to see what you think about the questions. So um, just in terms of uh, who we are as the GSMA, um, as I mentioned, I'm a senior insights and advocacy manager in the GSMA digital utilities program, but the GSMA overall um, represents the interests of mobile operators uh, worldwide. And within the GSMA, we have a mobile for development foundation, which drives innovation in digital uh, technology to reduce um, global inequalities. And um, we have a range of uh, different programs within Mobile for Development that support different topics that are important for the digital development agenda. We have a team looking at digital inclusion. We have another team uh, working on uh, Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation, so innovations in, in uh, complex emergency settings, and then also um, a mobile money team that looks at the role of digital payments. Um, uh, my team, the Digital Utilities Program, um, is focused on enabling access to affordable, reliable, safe, and sustainable urban utilities services through digital solutions and innovative partnerships. And we define um, urban utility services as energy, water, sanitation, waste management, and, and transport. Uh, we believe that these um, inclusive access um, to these services is key to support um, urban resilience, um, which allows better, uh, which allows cities in low and middle income countries to better withstand the challenges related to population growth, climate change, and inequality. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of our uh, program activities, um, we really uh, uh, try to support um, um, digital innovators working on urban utility service provision to achieve impact at scale. Um, and we do so uh, on the one hand by de-risking uh, these services by providing funding to, to different innovators. But more importantly, also um, through partnership facilitation. So we help a lot of um, innovators in the in the across different utility uh, sectors to partner with mobile operators, but also government um, uh, institutions. We also provide uh, technical advice to uh, mo mobile operators, municipalities, and utility service providers on the benefits of digital innovations in uh, urban utility service provision. And we conduct a lot of research and insights to provide more uh, insights and credibility to these uh, innovations um, that can be leveraged by, by donors and, and other funders as well. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, just a very brief overview of the role of different uh, digital innovations in, 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 the, in, in the water and sanitation sectors that, that we frequently work on. We, we work a lot on, on innovations that can um, improve affordability, whether that's uh, through pay go solutions or, or smart metering, um, more apl applicable, obviously, to the, to the water sector, but also we see some uh, of that in the sanitation sector increasingly. For the purpose of this session, what, what's more interesting is kind of our work around uh, GIS tracking but also Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine connectivity, as these um, innovations uh, allow um, um, both public and private sector actors to bring visibility and accountability to a quite complex uh, sanitation value chain. Um, and um, we, we also look at the role uh, increasingly of big data, obviously, that, that can play an important role in improving planning and decision making. And we'll hear more about that from our uh, panelists and presenters shortly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have a new report out um, that's called Innovative Data for Urban Planning, the Opportunities and Challenges of uh, Public-Private Data Partnerships. And uh, please check out our website if you want to uh, learn more about this. I'll just briefly go over some of the key points of the report. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so um, some of the key objectives of the report were to identify across which context and use cases mobile big data and data from private innovators can add uh, value as there's a lot of hype about data, but not, not a lot of research done on which use cases are particularly impactful. We also wanted to highlight the key barriers and enablers of public private data partnerships across different uh, contexts and use cases. Uh, we also wanted to provide some insights into how private uh, sector stakeholders can assess, navigate, and complement the public sector's existing uh, digital capacity without perpetuating a sort of data silos that aren't integrated into public sector data systems. And lastly, also understand how different stakeholders can help accelerate uh, public-private uh, data partnerships and realize untapped potential. Next slide, please. Um, so just uh, the slide is just to highlight that, you know, when you look at innovative data, there's different data sources from M and, uh, mobile operator data to geospatial slash remote sensing data, data from private utility service providers. But the key point is for innovative data to actually lead to action, actionable insights. It needs to go through a process of processing analytics have, has to be combined with uh, additional uh, qualitative and quantitative data sources. And then it needs to be packaged in a way that it can actually um, uh, provide uh, useful information in the right way uh, to policymakers. Uh, next slide, please. But when that's done, um, this data can actually be uh, relevant to a lot of different use cases um, to, you know, um, you know, improving non sewer sanitation in cities, uh, to tackling congestion, uh, integrated energy planning, uh, or monitoring a city's expansion. Um, thank you uh, very much. And with that, I pass on to Alex. And if you have any feedback or information about the, uh, the report to share with me, please, please get in touch. Thank you, George. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Knezovich, the Director of Operations at the Toilet Board Coalition and really excited to be here with you today. Uh, so super briefly before we get uh, into the, the meat of today's discussion, uh, the Toilet Board Coalition is the business of sanitation. Um, we are, were founded in 2015. We are a business-led membership organization that scales up and focuses on private sector engagement in SDG 6. Uh, so of course, what we're, what we're speaking about today. We work in two ways primarily. So one is with entrepreneurs from the ground up. Uh, we run a business accelerator program and do innovation labs that are designed to ready businesses for growth and scale and for investment and large scale partnerships. Uh, then we also work at an ecosystem level, which is really the thought leadership, the demonstration projects, uh, and innovative financing mechanisms that can drive the sector forward. Uh, over the last five years, uh, we've done sort of what's on the screen here. Uh, two things we're really proud of. One is that the 93% of graduates from our accelerator program are graduating with investment or with an MOU with a multinational uh, to grow and scale their work. And the second is, um, so George had shared about his, about their GSMA's latest report. Uh, we have 22 reports, um, one new one coming out with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in the coming days um, that are all available on our website at toiletboard.org. 
And where we're really coming from in today's conversation, so in 2017, we pioneered an approach called the sanitation economy, which is a very holistic look at the value and business opportunities that we see in the sanitation system and experience, both from a consumer perspective, but then also from an operator's perspective and a government perspective in terms of the service offering and the partnerships possible. So today's conversation, the, the toilet economy, the, the circle at the top, the blue is focused on access and the customer experience of actually using a toilet. Um, the circular sanitation economy is focused on the resources and output products that can be generated from sanitation systems, which help drive value back in to the sanitation experience. And then the third is the smart sanitation economy, which is where we're focused today. So that, as, as George mentioned, is focused on kind of the um, operations and maintenance um, optimizations that are possible through smart technologies and data and, and intelligence. Um, and then also looking at uh, preventative and predictive health, public health, and, and then consumer use data and insights um, that can help to power and inform the, the business models uh, at the core behind all of this. So I'll stop there. Um, we wanted to be brief and leave as much time as possible uh, for the incredible speakers that we have on the call today. Um, I will remind you to go back to the polls. Um, we would love to hear how many World Water Week sessions you've attended and get some of your initial thoughts. Uh, on public-private partnerships around data and information. And uh, with that, George, I hand it back to you. Thanks, Alex. Um, yes, um, um, right now I'm really excited to introduce uh, two great uh, speakers that will um, share a bit uh, more information about how uh, public, why public sector data systems are critical to drive uh, citywide inclusive sanitation. Uh, one On one hand, Deepa, um, a director at Athena Infonomics, uh, a data-driven a global consultancy that combines social science research methods and ICT tools to drive innovation in policies, processes, and programs in global development. And then Mwanza, a sanitation specialist for the Lusaka Water Supply and Sanitation Company, which has done some uh, pioneering work uh, on, the, on the usage of data to, to uh, accelerate access to um, sanitation in the city of Lusaka. And they'll uh, share a bit more information about the citywide inclusive sanitation services assessment and planning tool, uh, also known as SAP. And the SAP is a multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration between uh, regulators, utilities, technology service providers, and donors to strengthen city-scale uh, city scale data systems uh, for, to inform equitable, safe, and financial, financially viable models of delivering uh, sanitation. Uh, without taking further time away from, from the speakers, uh, let me turn it over to, to Deepa, that will share more uh, information on this, and again, encourage you to also um, answer the, the, uh, the question on um, why public safe data systems are so critical for a citywide sanitation. Right, no, thanks a ton, George. Really excited to be with all of you here and particularly Muwanza, uh, because I think Muwanza and her team have sort of been doing such incredible work in Lusaka, Zambia, and we're honored and grateful to have sort of been part of that process and learned from it. Um, so maybe what I can do George, sort of really use our experience with SAP to sort of as a, a point of reference to really reflect on, uh, on this question of data systems, right? And what triggers that and how, uh, so, okay, so what is SAP? SAP is essentially a macro planning software, really. What it does is it allows users to set targets around, for example, how many people you wanna reach in a city or um, what are your public expenditure targets, cost recovery targets, or think about, how much of your waste is collected and treated safely today and where you want to get that to, and then work backwards, right, to iterate on what service model combinations will get you to those targets, what combinations of what revenue models or market structure shifts will get you to that point. Now, because the service assessment and planning platform is a macro planning tool, right, like a platform like that, or an analytical engine like that works very well when the underlying data systems um, like how many customers are served, what is the level of service, what is the cost of service uh, and the price that they pay, et cetera, exist. Now, this is what I think makes Lusaka super fascinating because I think really, and I, and I, I think it'll be great, and I think Muanza will talk more about this in the session today, it's the evolution of Lusaka and how far they've come in sort of the policy, institutional and regulatory shifts 
that has shifted mandate, institutional mandates and processes and created the sort of political, socio-political environment and the techno-managerial environment that is necessitated, necessitated, sorry, investments in data in some sense. So it's the data is a is a proxy to and a byproduct of a journey of sector professionalization and formalization. And I think that's what makes Lusaka a fascinating story. So it's not, you don't start with data, you start with governance and data is a byproduct of that journey of shifts in policy institutions and regulatory mandates. Just as a quick example there, for example, Zambia has an independent regulator in Nuwasco, which mandated the utility LWSC to treat sanitation as a, as a profit center. And the minute that mandate, that regulatory mandate was brought in, now LUSA, LWSC had to start collecting costs and revenue data for sanitation separately from water um, and make shifts in their accounting and financial management systems. So it's that sort of shift in regulatory mandate that shifted what data they were collecting and what they were investing in. So it's really, and sometimes it's, it's not data-driven governance, it's governance-driven data, right? You shift the governance frameworks and that drives the kinds of investments you make in data systems and make stuff like SAP and other data investments, not a good to have thing, but a need to have thing, uh, really. And um, I think it's that journey that's fascinating. It's what were the circumstances that triggered those shifts in those policy institution and regulatory mandates that in turn created an enabling ecosystem for data. And I think that is what's, what is fascinating to focus on and think about and potentially also replicate. I'd like to, you know, Mwanza, you've been closely, you've been part of that journey and led much of it. And Mwanza can speak more to, more to this. I'm gonna hand it over to Mwanza. Uh, thank you very much, Dipa. Um, I, I think I like the fact that you've mentioned the fact that we can't not really rush to data before really putting in governance uh, structures. And I think that has really has happened in Lusaka. So um, we have the Lusaka sanitation uh, program, which is uh, basically implementing, it's a, a fully um, sanitation program that has different components that really also speak to the C-wise because we're just not looking at implementing one type of technology. We're trying to ensure that we cut off for each and every uh, person in the city. And this speaks to the what the requirements of a regulator must call. So in terms of uh, really uh, to bring it home to what we're really discussing about, under this Lusaka sanitation program, I think one thing that we did was we developed what we're calling a Lusaka sanitation system. In Zambia, we realize that certain mandates that still contribute to one thing sit with different uh, institutions. So in our case, we had to develop a system that will speak to the Ministry of Health, as well as Lusaka Water itself, as well as uh, and, uh, the local planning authorities is called Lusaka City Council. So basically the purpose of the Lusaka sanitation system helps Lusaka Water. The idea is we need to get a level where when we put up investments like Deepa was mentioning, we should be able to see the impact of those investments on the population. So in this case, we are looking at the key, um, the key indicators for Ministry of Health in a case where we see a rise in diarrhea cases or, or waterborne diseases, then that speaks to the water we are also providing as a utility or maybe the sanitation services that people have. And this also goes on apart from really looking at these institutions and the role and really trying to bring each the responsibilities that we have from different institutions to achieve one goal of providing safe water and uh, 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 clean water and safe sanitation and also meet the aspiration of SDG6. We also look, had to look at the service model, which Jipa spoke to earlier. Uh, so the Saka sanitation system has also integrated the various service model, especially for the construction of household toilets, as well as FSM services, because the mandates, like she earlier mentioned, NASCO changed the mandate of all utilities in the country. We are now called water and water supply and sanitation. So meaning even the responsibilities of sanitation has to be taken into consideration. So when we started, we actually put up the system to ensure that once we have a toilet constructed, we know it's constructed, we know how uh, what, what the cost is, and then we also know who's using it, what type of transition facility they have, because that also helps us then as a utility to make other decisions moving forward. So for instance, in terms of pit emptying, we should be able to come up with schedule dislodging because we've collected this information. But then also, something that also related this system to the SAP, especially is the fact that um, when we talk about um, NASCO, they provided us guidelines, accounting guidelines that 
uh, expected the utility to kind of understand the financing and the benefits each and every product and services that you're offering in the utility has. The Lusaka sanitation system doesn't really give us that kind of information. And so we had to incorporate, uh, looking at the SAP, that kind of gave us um, uh, an opportunity to really understand the financing and also the management of the systems that we have in, uh, in Lusaka water. Um, what we did basically looking at the tariff model, initially Lusaka water has one tariff and the sanitation is a percentage of that tariff. But we're trying to move to a situation where we understand the cost of providing a service as well as how much that goes in. That also speaks to the organizational setup because we've got different departments like the storage department that focuses on providing sanitation services. I mentioned the fact that we're constructing household sanitation facilities. We have an FSM business model that's set up as well as a storage uh, where we're running plants. But up to a certain point, we're not really able to actually accurately figure out how much we are spending on that cost. And the SAP tool helps us to actually understand what costs are going in. And then also, like Dipa mentioned, are we actually having those profits? That is a topic for a different discussion, but really as a utility, we need are trying to provide services that are business oriented because we're a commercial utility. Also bearing in the fact that we have households that we cannot really get full cost of and provide subsidies. But that is a reason why we decided to actually partner with, um, um, uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates to develop the SAP tool so that we're able to also understand and see the cost of providing uh, various services that we are putting up, especially sanitation and water services. Thank you, Tepa. Thank you, Mwanda. And I don't know, George, like happy to sort of, of course, and you know, if there are specific questions, I'm happy to sort of dive in, but really, and I, I, I really just want to call attention to th this point that, uh, because this journey has been very exciting. We've learned a lot through this process, but uh, really, I think, you know, when, and I think there's a lot of discussion, for instance, also in the context of GSMA on what are good success metrics, right? Like when you build a piece of software and the, or what does, what does success look like in digital, when you, in digital development and what does that look like in the public sector to drive public sector innovation and how data and how digital can enable that and, how does that look like? How does that all play out, sort of, really, in the context of a, uh, in, in in the context of public in, in public sector decision making? And I think, uh, just drawing from the SAP experience, really, uh, I we've really, I mean, we've learned to look beyond when we start off traditional KPIs like number of active users, right? Because this is not a, a, an accounting software or an ERP system that you can simply build and go out and scale and just say, I'm going to go from zero to 20,000 users. And that's my metric for success because the market doesn't really exist in that format yet. And the market is not mature enough today because the sector itself is at rather nascent stages of formalization. Uh, there are still gaps in public mandates and in capacities and resources, particularly when you think about something like sanitation. So really, I think it's 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 forced a certain level of humility as well in terms of what digital and data can do when the sector mandates capacities and resources don't exist really and start by therefore using the platform as a way to drive that conversation so really for us at the moment a lot of how we think about success has been anchored to how is this tool being leveraged to in the in the professionalization of utilities conversation for instance how is it then shaping the the conversation on data systems around accounting or financial management systems or hr systems how are we able to shape those and in turn be shaped by those realities where you know, SAP is not sort of like the standalone piece of software, uh, but really something that can integrate into the use case and digital ecosystem realities and sort of grow in a very faced and highly customized manner um, and get sort of adapted by different regulators and utility partnerships as they sort of, uh, as they deem fit. So I think really, I think reimagining that sort of what good success KPIs look like in when you think about both sort of data and digital tools to enable data in some sense. Um, I think th this journey has been an incredibly valuable learning curve uh, for us in that sense. It's taught us also quite a lot about uh, digital development processes themselves. Right? For instance, when we, in addition to, of course, Lusaka, Zambia, we have uh, active partnerships with uh, Kenya, 
Uganda and Tanzania, where we're also working with the national regulators uh, to both learn about where they are on the in that sort of sector formalization, professionalization journey, and how SAP can shape incrementally sort of uh, those shifts and where, and it's not so much about SAP as a standalone tool, but how SAP can shape conversations and account, accounting system updates or how SAP can shape conversations around um, customer uh, CRM uh, systems and allow for those systems in turn to help the sort of analytics a SAP like platform can provide. Uh, and I, I think, and personally for me, what's been most exciting is to keep track of that journey, right? Like what does that PI, the policy institution regulatory journey for Kenya look like and how that is different from Zambia and sort of the triggers that um, allow for those shifts. Um, so yeah, so this has been an incredibly exciting sort of learning process for us more than anything else, George, but happy to dive in or I don't, I don't know if we're at time, but respond to any specific questions that's, interesting to, to the group here. Thanks so much, uh, Deep and Monza, for, for that presentation. Um, and I, I think uh, two, two lessons to, to take away from, from, from this great uh, presentation is on the one hand, you know that uh, you know, pub, public sector data systems can't be copy pasted, but they have to sort of be uh, very responsive to the, to the context, context, regulation, institutional processes of, of, uh, of the location where they implement it. And it's really interesting to learn about how, how SAB sort of, how, how the, the data system that emerged in, in Lusaka is kind of a product of this evolution in, in institutions, regulations and processes. And the other point about obviously also sort of public sector leadership and championship of, of, of these initiatives uh, being very critical as well. So thanks, thanks so much for, for, for sharing those, those perspectives. Um, I think the next up, um, obviously we'll have the chance maybe for, for questions later on, but um, I think next up we have uh, Alex with um, the moderation of the, of the panel uh, discussion now. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about the work of Athena um, that Deepa just described, you can click on the files section of this session and we've uploaded some information um, on there that provides further context. Great. Thank you, George. Thank you, Deepa and Mwanza. Um, we have had one or two questions come in through the chat. So um, Lena and, and Orko, we will strive to answer those throughout the panel. And if not, uh, then certainly at the end of the session and feel free anyone else to, to enter in questions there as well. And uh, the speakers will also be tuned into the chat and can answer directly through that. Great. Well, um, Without further ado then, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, everyone to Asim Valero from Fluid Robotics, Nicholas Curia from Pit Fedora, Laura Mugea from Synergy, and John Peter Archer from Gather, um, who are going to, we have some questions to get them started, uh, and then are just hoping to kind of bring a conversation that speaks about their journeys uh, as entrepreneurs in this space, building businesses um, that are using data, uh, around sanitation and with cities and uh, learn from what they've learned and then also hopefully um, be inspired a bit. So Laura, I'd like to start off with you. Um, Synergy has partnered with the Spatial Collective to utilize GIS mapping and drone imagery uh, to map the informal settlements of, I'm gonna mess up the name, sorry, but <laughs> Vivendani. Uh, can you tell us a bit about um, what Synergy has been able to learn from this mapping and the imagery and how you are seeing that impact um, the decision making uh, throughout the business. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I didn't butcher the name. Uh, it is Riwangani. <laughs> so good on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, previously we worked with Special Collective to map uh, one of the areas that we work in, uh, which is an urban slum in Nairobi called Rwandani. And uh, at times as organizations and communities, we are interested in using data to inform our decisions and also to improve our processes. But uh, in some cases, data is not available. Um, and that's, that does not mean that we would sit back and then not uh, use data. Uh, that then would drive us to actually create this data for us to use. And that's what happened between Synergy and Special Collective who supported us in uh, creating location-based data um, in some of the areas that we are working in. And this involved actually mapping the areas. So we ended up having building footprints of these regions. 
Um, and uh, this was very important because uh, we were able to understand the communities that we are serving. Because uh, at times we have good solutions, we have developed uh, really good technologies uh, that we could implement in our communities to improve sanitation. But we need to understand actually the problem on the ground and then see uh, how we can efficiently serve them. So uh, first of all, uh, we're really able to understand how these communities are structured, what they're actually looking for, and how we could tailor our solutions to actually meet their needs. Um, and that was very really important for the organization as a whole. Uh, another thing is that also when looking at sanitation, um, it's tied to uh, sort of personal things to us. So it's our homes, it's our schools, uh, it's our churches, uh, market centers and all that. So by mapping also these areas, we're able to understand all this and see how we are able to serve these communities. Uh, so uh, if you're looking at schools, you're not maybe looking to install one, one, uh, one toilet, so maybe we need a couple of those. Uh, maybe we need to distribute this by gender, uh, by age and all that. Um, then the other thing was also on asset management. Uh, so uh, once we have these facilities, how we, how are we able to efficiently manage them? Uh, I think Deepa mentioned something about the cost of service. So uh, in as much as you're providing solutions, are we able to reduce on costs? Um, so that also we are able to do this efficiently and able to manage these facilities from time to time. Um, and then lastly was also, I'd say in terms of uh, its effect in terms of business operations was understanding the market potential. So uh, mm. looking at uh, looking at this area in Viwandani, how huge it is, um, how many plots are there and where are we right now? So uh, are we able to sort of use this data to see what do we need to reach to the remaining uh, part of the community. So I'd say those are the three main reasons, uh, main effects that we have seen uh, after getting this data in conjunction with Special Collective. Great, thank you so much. So, so that imagery and mapping, it's helping Synergy to, to really understand their, their customer, to understand um, the community that they're operating in, their needs, and then also maybe where the, the opportunities for growth are. So quite quite powerful uh, in, in that point. Thank you, Laura. We'll, we'll come back to you uh, in a moment. John, I wanted to come over to, to you. So you've, Gather has developed a standard um, as a part of the process of setting up uh, the Antonarivo Sanitation Data Hub. Can you tell us um, a bit about kind of what was evolving in the project um, that necessitated the development of a standard. So we've just heard from Mwanza and Deepa the, the, you know, the value and um, necessity to have governance before data. Um, so I think I anticipate you'll probably build on that, um, but would love to hear kind of where you all came at it um, and how you came to that, that need. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Alex. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting to hear a very similar journey to what Deepa and Monza were sharing um, in Lusaka. Um, so when we first started working with the uh, municipality in Antenna Revo, um, they kind of shared quite clearly that their goal was to achieve total sanitation by 2037 within the resources they had available. Um, and that one of their key successes was going to be closer cooperation with private sanitation providers and so when we started to look at the existing ecosystem and kind of data infrastructure, there is a national sanitation database for Madagascar, but it doesn't include any data for Antanarivo. And then when we started to dig a little bit deeper, uh, we found that actually a lot of the different organizations, about 66% of them had never even tried to access it and also didn't, um, didn't weren't interested in, it, in sharing data at that point. Um, so we kind of gathered everyone around <laughs> a kind of virtual table uh, to kind of really try to see, can everyone understand and explore that they're all facing the same challenges and difficulties in building a, an authoritative baseline for the city. Um, and as that conversation uh, continued, kind of between the municipality and the, the private providers, they kind of saw actually we're all facing the same data challenges here, um, both internally and externally. So they started to see that um, the benefit of the data standard. And I think as well, we started incredibly simply. So our data standard is based on um, ISO 19115 and the attributes that we've selected are the most basic at the moment. Um, so it really was about how can we um, help the different organizations with their different respective uh, data capacities start to collect data in a way that they can share it internally, but can also um, upload it to one baseline, which gives them a better overview of the entire city. Um, so we still definitely um, have a long way to go. And the plan is to start to 
uh, extend that data standard, both in terms of the number of people using it and also what the data standard covers in terms of attributes. But um, we've kind of seen a situation from where no data was being shared between organizations to 20 data sets have been shared in the last um, seven months, which is really exciting to start to see that kind of closer cooperation um, and partnerships then being agreed based on right now we know uh, and understand the problem that more clearly we can understand the opportunity. So th that's that's really interesting just in terms of you know there there can be data collected um, but if it's not being accessed and used then of course we're, we're not really we're not going the full way and and so gather was quite proactive in terms of gathering the community and, and those partners around and I think that's where um, you all have you know, exemplified it, an incredible example of where this has to come from. I mean, it's not just technology that, as George said, that you're copying and pasting onto a, a new location or, or a new technology. This is absolutely um, a very personal process and a bespoke process, Deepa was, was saying as well. So, um, John, have you, from that, um, you know, building those relationships with the community, with the government, um, we understand the importance of it. Is there um, another point or a tip that you would give kind of to, to participants today of like, how do you work with a community to help them see the value of that data um, or with a government for them to understand the value of, of that information? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. And one thing that we have certainly learned in the last seven, seven months actually comes back to this governance question again. It was making sure there were assurances that actually it was going to be a local data governance system and the data was going to be locally owned and the kind of data sovereignty was going to remain within uh, the municipality. I think a uh, very um, understandable nervousness of the extraction of data or talent um, and then it being inaccessible to local decision makers. So really uh, working to kind of make it clear that actually everything we're building in terms of the data system from the standards to the analysis is all gonna be local. So I think that um, allowed people to be confident in kind of participating in the process. And I think as well, um, and similar to what has already been shared, like we definitely maintaining a level of software and um, agnostic approach. So um, keeping it very simple, um, not over delivering in terms of what the software can look like or what the tool can look like, but keeping it at its most basic so that it can really easily and quickly pivot um, as the local decision makers are responding and saying, well, now we know that this is possible. Actually, the real problem we have is this. How can we tackle that rather than over engineering something? So I think those two things together kind of are joined by just keeping it as local and responsive to the decision makers and their need as possible. Simple, local and responsive, absolutely. Well, Asim, I'm gonna to come to, to you next uh, from Fluid Robotics. So your, so Fluid Robotics was, was already collecting data and information pre uh, the pandemic. Um, but what you found was an, an opportunity to really evolve your services. Um, and well, I'll let you say it uh, best, but we'd, I'd love to add into this conversation here, kind of your journey over the last 18 months specifically um, in terms of how you've been working with the, the government and, and the information that you've been collecting. Perfect, uh, thanks Alex. So, uh, you know, pre-COVID our focus was on wastewater infrastructure data uh, because the problem in India was that um, you know, for uh, less than 30% of the wastewater that's generated that leaves homes and industries actually gets to a treatment plant. More than 70% of it ends up uh, discharged into the environment untreated. And a lot of times that 30% that gets treated ends up in the same lakes and rivers where the untreated wastewater is getting discharged. So there's very little reuse. So, uh, and the root cause for this was uh, there was very little data of this underground uh, infrastructure that was present, which uh, which led to uh, basically no maps, no condition information that led to sanitary sewer overflows. So in India, there are about 50 billion uh, liters a day of uh, SSOs uh, happen. So what we did was we lo started looking at wastewater infrastructure around lakes and rivers and how that could, uh, how that data could be used to rewire underground drain networks to then redirect wastewater away from water bodies to treatment facilities or pumping stations. So try to help 
cities optimize existing infrastructure to increase wastewater treatment, reducing urban uh, water pollution. Now, having done that for a few years, uh, just before COVID, uh, and then COVID started, we saw that uh, cities across the world were actually um, testing wastewater at sewage treatment plants to try and see if they could identify uh, the presence of COVID and then to see if they could predict outbreaks. And uh, we saw that uh, there was something that we could easily adapt uh, to doing. And uh, again, you know, the, uh, these uh, cities from Europe and Australia and the US that were doing this uh, had, uh, you know, the, the, had the benefit that almost 100% of the wastewater that was uh, that was being discharged from communities was getting to a treatment plant. Uh, whereas in India, we only had about 30%. So how do we effectively monitor an entire catchment area uh, and be able to you know, predict outbreaks? So we, we are actually able to leverage our experience monitoring wastewater infrastructure uh, to then start monitoring the spread of COVID. And then you know, with issues like uh, industrial effluent also flowing through the same drain, uh, which meant, you know, RNA degradation was quite rapid uh, in India as compared to uh, outside of India. We were able, actually able to um, drive product development in that direction. So we had very uh, local issues that we were dealing with. So that so that transition from just wastewater infrastructure to looking at uh, public health uh, issues as well through wastewater, I think that's been a, a very interesting journey in the last uh, year, year and a half. I'd love to hear, I seem a bit too how, you know, I think it can be easy and, and I look to the others on, on, on the call, but I think it can be easy for people to dismiss sanitation data as perhaps not necessary. Um, don't we just need access? Don't we just need to treat it? Why do we need to build other systems and go through all the trouble and expense and investment of, of data collection around it? Um, but I, I'm interested in, in your relationships and conversations with the, with stakeholders of how this transition from just wastewater treatment to then public health. Um, did, mm -hmm. you, did you sense a shift in the value and the valuation of this information? Um, and is that something mm -hmm. that we as other you know, professionals in, in the sector can, can learn from? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, even when we were doing just infrastructure monitoring, uh, initially, obviously, you know, and we were doing this since 2016, uh, not many cities took it seriously. They said, you know, if you want to deal with water pollution, we'll remove water hyacinth from the lakes and we'll remove solid waste from the bottom of the river and, uh, you know, and problem solved for this year. But that was, again, not looking at the root cause. It was looking at the symptom of the pollution. Um, and through our uh, infrastructure optimization approach, we were actually able to show very concrete uh, results both, you know, uh, not just environmental impact, but also economic impact because um, the cities, the normal approach was let's build new treatment facility uh, and that, you know, to treat about a million liters a day in urban India costs up to half a million dollars, right? And you have existing treatment facilities running at 40%, 50%. So just by helping optimize this infrastructure, we were able to save a lot of money. So we, we monitor upwards of a billion liters a day uh, and today about 700 million liters a day uh, is being um, uh, redirected to treatment facilities. So, the, so you can imagine the savings there. Now, uh, now that we've already done this work in these cities and we understand how the infrastructure is, uh, when we started doing uh, uh, COVID monitoring, uh, we saw that the clear impact uh, would be demonstrated if we could show that we are able to predict uh, the next wave that's coming. Because uh, you know, it takes about uh, a week, ten days to develop symptoms. By that time, you know, the hospitals are full. Uh, you don't have enough oxygen. Uh, so when we started showing the city that we could actually start detecting a change in viral loads just by day two, day three, uh, they realized that, that this would be, you know, uh, it, it, you know, there, there's no debate there. You know, how what the value of that information would right. be on the the healthcare infrastructure. Uh, so we've had a lot more support uh, with the initial work we've done and now, you know, with public health uh, and the way, uh, you know, the, the first two outbreaks, uh, the first two waves have impacted Indian cities. Uh, we've seen a lot of support uh, from municipalities. Thanks, Asim. So, Nicholas, I want to come come to you next. Um, Pit Vidura has similar, I think, in, in to what we were hearing from Laura uh, from Sanergy. So Pit Vidura has been using data to develop 
customer clustering uh, and, and shifting some of focus on shifting some of the um, economics of, of your operating expenses. Can you um, share how, how this has been impacting um, the, your growth strategy and, and kind of how the business develops? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, we are a sanitation uh, a company which operates in Kigali and we offer Petra Cleans uh, emptying services in uh, low income uh, urban dense areas. So the data collection, we say it's part of our culture and we collect data in part, uh, different parts of our operations. So uh, we operate a call center where leads or potential customers through our various marketing channels usually reach out uh, and their uh, information is uh, recorded. So after that, uh, we also do this uh, uh, assessment uh, of their pit latrines uh, and the geolocation pit characteristics are also collected on this, uh, in that process. Uh, during the emptying process, also uh, the service provider, they usually collect the, uh, the duration, uh, time and motion, duration where which, uh, each and every task is, uh, uh, is taking. So we believe this is not uh, this is not our data, and this data can be able to be helpful to uh, uh, to the uh, to the sector. But on our side, uh, like tracking the duration and the location uh, uh, of emptying event, usually allow us to be able to uh, uh, to track this uh, uh, operational bottlenecks on emptying processes uh, and be able to put uh, uh, interventions or improving those uh, uh, those. Uh, processes. So uh, on, on our operation cost, uh, one of our main uh, major challenge, or one of our main cost uh, drivers is the logistic cost, that is fuel and uh, maintenance of the trucks. And they usually account to up to 60%, over 60% of our uh, operating costs. Yeah. So, and this is because if you, if you, get, a, if you get a customer and without the availability of the transfer station, you have to drive to the uh, to the dumping site, which is located uh, 18 kilometers from the city, you know, and that drives now uh, uh, the cost of operation. So geographical clustering of customers usually allow us uh, to share this logistic cost among as, as many customers as we can be able to empty in one day. And how we usually do that with the information that the, with the information of the potential customers that usually collect through our call center, we send targeted messages. Uh, to specific uh, customers in the area that we want to uh, to get a cluster. So if you get a cluster in a customer in uh, area B, we go to a CRN system, uh, we use uh, uh, Salesforce, and we check potential customers who have been interested and who have, who have not yet made the decision uh, of emptying. And we wanted to group them uh, so that they can be able to empty together. So. Uh, this uh, this has not been uh, a straight line because yeah. some people, <laughs> some customers they are going to uh, they are going to call in their state of emergency and yeah. they cannot be able to wait uh, uh, they cannot be able to wait for the uh, for the cluster to form so we have uh, discounted prices so during our evaluation we have the discounted prices that you can be able to be emptied at this price but if you empty as a group. You can be able to, to be emptied uh, uh, with this mm -hmm. price. So we want the, them also to help us uh, uh, talking to the uh, neighbors or the people they know they have a problem like that because it's a community. People understand some of their uh, neighbors' challenges. They can be able to uh, to empty together. But still, uh, also one of uh, other challenge uh, which is indicated, uh, which is usually brought by the 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 the. the uh, the time and motion data that you usually collect is that although you want to empty uh, for more people at once, sometimes it's possible. It's not possible because some tasks are very time uh, uh, intensive. They take a lot of time. So we did an analysis uh, last year uh, uh, of the time and motion assessment, and we found that the trust fishing, uh, trust fishing is the activity that you usually remove the solid waste on a pit before we pump uh, the sludge, and which is a non-value adding task. Uh, takes, was taking uh, 32 percent of the total uh, emptying time, uh, where mm -hmm. the value adding task, which is a uh, pumping, uh, which the customer they are paying for, is only is taking uh, uh, 31 percent. 
So the emptying for one customer was taking around uh, three hours. That was two hours and 50 minutes. So, you know, if you, uh, although we want to, uh, we, we are trying to lower uh, or to, uh, to, uh, to reduce this gap uh, of a uh, high cost of emptying uh, with the customer's uh, 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 willingness to pay, but we are doing that on our, uh, reducing our cost uh, of pollution. So the data that you usually collect, this data, uh, they usually help us understanding this processes, the time intensive processes, it usually make us be able to, uh, to understand where we put my, uh, more efforts on. So currently we are working on the trust fishing because the non-value adding cars taking a lot of time. If we improve that below the duration of the time that we are serving one customer, that means the clustering that we are forming, we can be able to surface more customer that we can be able to, to get. And that means customer get to pay lower prices and we get to lower our cost of uh, uh, operations. That's great. Thank you, Nicholas. I mean, just a, a super tangible and I, I think really clear way to see the the impact of of the information and then i mean I, I love you started with data collection as a part of our culture i think that's um for i'm trying to think of a business where that that isn't a good move um i think that's a, a really great foundation and uh, a great uh, way to to look at at business growth in general um excellent well uh, we've still got some time. Um, so I wanted to come back. A, a few of you have touched on this, uh, John, in, in terms of the relationship with the community, Laura, as well, the, the relationships with the community around data and data sharing. Um, as I think this is a, a individual's first question when you think about sanitation data um, and public private partnerships with communities and, and sort of customers and, and all of that. Um, does anyone have? you know, a story or a, a, a top tip as you're approaching conversations around data sharing. Um, I think, John, it, it was you who had said, just keeping it local as much as possible um, and simple. So what you're con collecting is really, you know, the bear of what, what's needed um, to for the information. Um, Laura, perhaps, do you, do you have anything from Synergy's work with the Spatial Collective, but also kind of your own work in communities where you've seen um, what unlocks people's understanding or customers' understanding of why this information is, is really useful um, for them to share and, and, and for Synergy or, or the municipalities to be able to, to see and, and use. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, uh, in terms of data collection and privacy and also like, all the things that we need to consider when sharing data. I think it's very important, important to make sure communities where we are collecting data are understanding how this uh, helps them or impacts their lives. So um, if, if I'm getting where your house is located, um, am I adding more information such as uh, your name, your phone number and all that, are we tying things together? And if you're doing that, is it really necessary? So I guess also just emphasizing on not just sharing and like uh, just getting what's needed uh, at, the really, at the most basic level. And yes, at times uh, we need more information. Uh, uh, I guess also even looking back at Synergy's work, uh, especially when you're looking at asset management, we would need to tie uh, where where you are, uh, where the facility is, your name, your phone number, your history in terms of payments and all that. So, uh, but then uh, I guess I think for organization now to consider is if I'm going to share this data openly, then I would need to scrap some things off and not share all this info. So yeah, I'd say uh, just a thing to consider is making sure communities are understanding. Um, um, the importance of this uh, data being collected and how it's actually going to be used. It's actually more work <laughs> for the organization, but it's uh, an important step to, to, to consider. And to Sean, Sean, I saw you nodding in agreement. Is there anything you'd wanna add to that? I don't think so. I think um, Laura's point of actually a little bit more work from the organization side is actually the key, kind of doing some of that heavy lifting mm -hmm. at the beginning um, I think then can leads to establish, it establishes that element of trust and co-ownership, which is, I think we have found is just essential. So, um, although it is a lot of hard work, it definitely uh, pays the dividends for sure. Mm 
And I see my note, we've, we've been in conversations with partners about also just how the pandemic has raised people's awareness of public health and hygiene efforts. And, and also I think a collective sense of we, that you know, we, um, our impacts and our health has, you know, impacts our community and, and those around us. Um, and in some countries there have, you know, have been contact tracing applications and, and things where people are sharing already right now, more um, clean, safe uh, information, but about public health. Um, are you seeing a shift around that as well um, within your own experience or, or conversations or any thoughts about maybe where you see it going? And then George, I'll hand back to you in, in just a second after this. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the way, you know, I think uh, both John and Laura, you know, were on point in terms of you know, the, the organization needs to take the first step and we deal with a lot of public uh, data as well. Now, uh, the way we uh, look at it is, um, we try to gather as much data as we can, uh, but at the same time, we anonymize a lot of uh, the information that's present. So for example, if I collect uh, information of either COVID outbreaks, or if I'm collecting information about pipelines, uh, the location is anonymized. So my, uh, so uh, internally, Fluid Robotics can continue to process that data to build better products, uh, but at the same time, ensuring that the information uh, remains uh, you know, uh, confidential. So uh, we've seen the government being more open to that kind of an approach um, where we've uh, been able to anonymize a lot of the data, uh, but, but have a clear um, the channel of communication with stakeholders within the administration. So we've sort of seen that and, and, and wastewater uh, data itself is uh, anonymized because they, especially related to the pandemic because we're collecting data from like half a million people or 100,000 people, not knowing exactly who it is, but uh, just sort of narrowing it down to catchment area. Great, thanks Asim. George, back, back to you. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. I'll, I'll just, um, before wrapping up, um, um, ask a couple of questions that came through uh, uh, through the chat uh, function to some of our uh, presenters and panelists. Maybe we'll start with um, uh, Barbara Schreiner's question. Uh, I think, John, you might be best placed to answer this one. Um, so um, uh, Barbara is interested to what extent uh, the data that is collected is made transparently and freely available uh, to the public. Uh, obviously, it depends a bit uh, on the examples which we've spoken about uh, today, but uh, I think the, with regards to Gather's example, could you uh, talk a bit more about why it's so impactful for data that might be collected by private service providers to then to also be available to, to the public sector and the public more generally? Yeah, of course. I think you um, can see some really interesting applications in the transportation sector where more location data and other information was opened up and then we've seen the expansion of uh, digital tools to kind of help users navigate their way across different cities all across the world um, and I think within water and sanitation um, I, I think part of the process of looking to open up data I think immediately uh, moves the conversation to accountability and to transparency and starts to uh, I, I think it was talked about kind of data being our culture and I think those two things are really important so actually when you're considering what data can we make openly available you're already starting to embed uh, accountability and transparency into your processes and starting to have that as an ongoing conversation not just a one-off thing so I think that can really help as much as then what people can do with the data once it's been made available. Thanks a lot, John. Um, I, next question um, I have is for, I think, Asim. Um, uh, it's from Marine Mato, and it's um, asking about how effective um, COVID wastewater surveillance in, in, in India is, given that um, so many uh, households have over 70% of households in India rely on uh, on-site sanitation and how that's captured uh, by your solution. Uh, yeah, great question. And uh, when we started designing a program for uh, monitoring uh, wastewater to detect COVID, we, we were faced with these exact same problems. So uh, at least in the larger cities like Mumbai, Pune, Bangalore, Delhi, uh, sort of the large metros, uh, you still have um, very few um, 
buildings or houses having uh, you know uh, pits or or sumps to uh, to collect wastewater uh, it's mostly the uh, discharge through a network of open or pipe drains to either the coastline or to the lake or the river so almost 60 70% of the wastewater that's flowing through a city is flowing through this network of drains that runs parallel to your sewage uh, sewer and and stp infrastructure so this is like an entirely different system that eventually gets discharged somewhere in the environment so when we have to when we had to design this program we had to look at um, you know both this infrastructure look at stps and we had to look at these drains as well because when you want to uh, and and our goal is to build an early detection system so to be able to predict uh, that the next wave is going to come to do that we need to effectively um, sample uh, wastewater from a catchment area so we want to try and collect 100% of uh, or at least capture 100% of the wastewater that's coming so we had to look at stps sewers and uh, uh, this network of drains and uh, for specifically for slums and public toilets we're actually going and collecting samples right at the source uh, so right at the outlet and getting it tested thanks a lot asim i would I'll let, let you speak a bit more about given that i want still want to get one last question in for deepa yeah, um um uh, uh, before we get kicked out of the session um deepa the question i think you you answered a bit already in the chat but it would be maybe good for the rest of the audience to also understand um i think arco uh, asked um can you um um you know give some more concrete examples of of data use um um in the context of the the sap tool um um yeah that would be great Sure. So uh, very quickly, I think be because we we started by working with regulators, tariff reviews and appraisals has been one of the more dominant use cases. But and I think that the tariff review process sparks off a discussion about investment models, right? And then you know which sort of goes into the realm of how service providers think about what combinations of service models are most viable, but will also allow them to reach their targets or service delivery targets. Um, and I think. What's particularly fascinating and something that's often under, we, we don't spend enough time is really business model innovation beyond infrastructure diversification, right? Like, can we, you know, go going from something as simple as um, on demand to schedule desludging can change so much about who gets covered and at what cost. Um, and it need not always be a conversation anchored around infrastructure investments. And I think th those have also sort of been really fascinating outcomes um, from this, but tariff appraisal that then has led to a lot of discussion around investment planning. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I, I just, I, I, we don't have much time and the session might, might end, but I just want to thank uh, all the, all the, all the uh, people that have joined uh, the session today. I think we've, um, we've gone, you know, behind, beyond the hype uh, around uh, data in, in sanitation and, and waste management and provided some concrete examples of how data plays a role in improved uh, sanitation and waste management with examples from Antananarivo, Nairobi, Pune, Kigali, and Lusaka, and I thank um, all the, the great panelists and presenters for sharing their work here. Um, if, you, if you want to keep the conversation going, please feel free to reach out to us um, at the GSMA Digital Utilities Program or at the Toilet Board Coalition. We'd be really keen um, to, to speak further. And um, yeah, I, I, I just, just kind of uh, like to summarize um, that, you know, uh, data really has to be grounded in, in, in local context and, uh, and uh, the, the role data can play is really dependent on how responsive it is to the needs of, uh, you know, local stakeholders, whether they be in the public and private or private sector, but if applied, uh, uh, in this integrated fashion and if responsive to their context, um, data can play a transformational role and, and catalyze uh, many important changes that we need in urban sanitation and waste management. Uh, with that, uh, thanks, thanks again for joining the session and uh, I hope to see you around other World Water Week sessions as well. Thanks. <laughs> thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks.